Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Father, we, whoops. Yeah, turn, yeah, turn it out. Father, we do thank you for the blood and yes, for the Father. cleansing power, the healing power, the precious blood of the Lamb. We're just so grateful that you and the Son cut a covenant, a better covenant, Lord God, than the previous one. Yes, yes. One that endures forever. It's an eternal covenant, the precious blood of the Lamb that you ratified in your body and in your blood and with even yes, better promises. Yes. And we're grateful for all that you accomplished then. And it keeps on doing that, Lord. It never ends. We just are grateful for all that you have done. And Lord, we do come before you today and we bow our hearts low and we just ask that you give us the revelation of your son. As, as Ken teaches on covenant, give us that greater revelation of the covenant, Lord God. We know we've heard it, we know it, but Lord, there's a deeper place you want to take us in it. Lord God, we want it to become bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh, especially in the days that are coming. We need that, that we would hold on to the covenant and that we would not let go, oh God. We thank you that your words are yes and amen and all the promises of God are yes in you, in you Jesus, and yes. we're grateful for that. And Lord, I do pray that you would just just anoint Ken, just take him out of the way, Lord, as we pray so much that you would give him the tongue of a ready writer, that he would make known the deep things of God concerning the covenant, Lord, that we would see it in a new way and that he would speak not by power nor by might but by your spirit. We just ask for your river of life to flow through him to us that it will, not, that it will impart life. We ask for those life-giving words to come forth. In Jesus' name. Yes, amen. Amen. Um, let me just kind of share where we're headed today and, and actually next week, too. Um, about a year ago, early 2020, the Lord just really put in my heart the uh, sensing that uh, we as his church, no, I think it's not just us, but the, the church, that we need to learn to live by covenant. Uh, based on probably what is coming in the earth, and, and who knows, I don't want to get into all that today, but, but w what is coming that is going to become more and more important that believers learn about covenant and learn to live by uh, the power of the blood that's activated through covenant, through our covenant relationship uh, with the Lord. So I've felt that for a year or so, and actually when we were doing the blog post back a year or so ago, I wrote a number of posts about living by covenant. Um, and as leadership team, as we were meeting the beginning of the year as to what you know, we wanted to do for this year, we talked about uh, doing a, 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 a series of many series, really, on the whole issue of covenant. And so this week and next week, I'm going to talk about an overview of what living by the new covenant really is because most American believers have no idea about it, really. Uh, and then at some point in time, I want to do a, a series, a brief series on walking in divine health and healing. And then we'll do one on provision and we'll do one on protection, getting divine protection. Those three uh, issues are ones that the Lord really has put on my heart that we need to highlight and that we need to learn to live by the covenant promises that uh, are pertained to those three specific issues. So that'll be different times during the, sea, during the year. We'll go into do those mini-series. But this, this one, this week and next week, I want to just kind of do an overview of what covenant living is. Uh, and then, you know, in a month or two or whatever, whenever, we'll do the other, some of the other series. So that's kind of where we're headed uh, with this. Um, I do want to just make you aware... Um, Actually, we won't have time in this week and next week to even come close to talking about this. But I did write a book on, it's called in your Inher Understanding Your Inheritance in Christ. And it goes into a lot of detail on what is involved in living by covenant. Uh, and so I wrote it uh, 10, 15 years ago. I, I haven't read it in a while, so I'm probably some things I wouldn't agree with in it. But overall, I think it really, uh, it really uh, is good. So anyway, there's some out on the table out there. They're free. If you 
Uh, if, you, if you want to read and study more into that, you know, feel the freedom to, to take one uh, of those. So, okay, so let's, um, let's get started. Uh, we want to talk about uh, just uh, our covenant in Christ. Let's, let's start out with going to Genesis chapter 15. This was kind of interesting. Uh, you know, Genesis 15 is when God actually cut the covenant with Abraham. Uh, and, you know, in Genesis 12, uh, God told Abraham, if you'll leave your homeland and you'll, you know, leave your family and you'll leave and you'll follow me, then I'll make you a great nation and all that. We won't uh, take the time to go there. But that was in Genesis chapter 12. And, and so Abraham did that. He went and he left and he pursued uh, God in that way. But then in Genesis chapter 15 um, is when the actual covenant is cut. Uh, and so you can, uh, in, you can see starting with probably about verse 9, and I'm not going to read that, but it, uh, all of that, it's just, uh, but what happened was that God had Abraham uh, cut a sacrifice to lay it out, and God ran through the pieces of the, uh, of, the, of the sacrifice and cut the covenant with Abraham. But the verse I want to talk about uh, is verse 11. And the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. Uh, and that's a lot of what I want to talk about in this series, is I think this is kind of shares the, uh, a major part of the point that God wants us to understand is that God wants us to learn how to drive these birds of prey uh, out, of, out of our life so that we can live in the fullness of what God wants us to live in. Uh, and it was interesting today, uh, you know, we have about a 30-minute drive from our house here, and we've been driving that way for four or five years. I forgot exactly how long we've lived at our house there. Uh, and this had never happened before until today, but uh, we were driving down the road, and there was this, huge flock of birds that were just uh, kind of right on, on the ground, I guess. And just as we went by, at least, probably, I would say, I'm, you know, I don't think I'm exaggerating, probably at least a, like a hundred birds. And they just flew right in front of our car and, they, and the car shooed them away uh, from hitting us. And then the Lord just spoke to Don and I both and said, that's what this series is all about. He wants to teach us to live in a way that we can shoo these birds of prey that come to try to steal, kill, and destroy our life so that we can have victory, so that we can live in victory in the fullness of what God wants us to do, especially as the systems of America and the Western culture uh, begin to fall apart. You know, well, I mean, realistically, the American church has lived uh, by the quality of the American health care system, uh, the success and the victory of the American economy, uh, and the up until not too long ago, the, uh, the protection of the of the of our government and our uh, police and all of, all of that. Uh, but that could be changing in the days ahead, and we're going to learn. We're going to have to learn to live by the promises of God in a greater, greater way. And so that's where I want to go to as we talk uh, about covenant. Um, I want to just kind of give a little bit of an overview uh, of it, some general principles, and then we want to talk about some of the steps of, of covenant making. So let's turn to Hebrews chapter 8. The whole book of Hebrews is great, and there's a lot in here about the new covenant. But Hebrews 8, verse 6 says this. Um, by now he is he has obtained a, by, by now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. So Christ is the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. And it's the new covenant. You know, we, Jesus talked about that, and, uh, and even later here in this chapter, uh, it talks about that. But Jesus talked about it even in the context of, uh, of taking communion. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. So there's a new covenant uh, that Christ cut uh, when he came to earth. 
uh, that was secured at the cross, secured by the shedding of his blood. And he's the mediator uh, of that covenant. And so we are, uh, New Testament believers are in a, in a covenant relationship with God through Christ. We are in a, when we are born again, we, are in, we enter into a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, and I want to make this point, because we sang about being born again uh, a, a little bit earlier. Uh, there's not, the, a lot of people kind of live this way, that there's a covenant lifestyle, and, there, there's, and there's a lifestyle where I just confess a set of facts about Jesus, and I'm born again because I believe that set of facts about him. Uh, it's almost like there's two ways to live as a believer uh, in Christ if you think about it in a practical way. There's, a, I, I believe this, uh, and I, you know, I, I, I confess it, but I'm not living in covenant with the Lord and all that is, in, is involved in that. And then there's another way that says I'm going to live in covenant. But I want to say this as we begin, there's not two ways the only way to enter into heaven and to enter into salvation uh, and, and ultimately into heaven is to enter into the covenant, is enter into the new covenant. Jesus cut a new covenant uh, that incorporated the Gentiles, that incorporated all of us into his kingdom. And we have to learn what that means so that when we uh, accept him, we're also accepting all that covenant is. Now we don't we're not fully mature in it, obviously not. There's a lifetime of maturing in all this, these things. But the decision is not to just believe a set of facts about Christ. It's to, to agree to, I'm going to pursue a covenant walk with the Lord. Amen? Amen. So we're in a new, Christ cut a new covenant, and we are in a new covenant relationship with him. Now, what does covenant do? Covenant binds us to Christ. And for the importance of what we're talking about today, it also binds Christ to us. It, it draws us together as one where Christ can draw from us, but we can also draw from him. Uh, you know, if you look at the definition uh, of the word covenant in the Hebrew and in the Greek and uh, in English, it, it, you get this concept that it's a formal, it's a solemn agreement. It's a compact. Uh, even the Hebrew word talks about cutting uh, because there's sacrificial uh, animals that are, that, are, that are, when you enter into a covenant, the sacrifice is made, the flesh is cut open, uh, and uh, the blood flows, and you walk between that. So it's a picture of cutting uh, in that uh, sense. But it has the idea uh, of binding or fettering two people to, as one. And that's what covenant does. It, it binds us together with Christ. It binds us together as one with him so that we're no longer independent. We're no longer living our own way. We are, we're, we've come and decided that I'm going to live as one with this man, Christ Jesus. It by, it's an agreement that begins that process uh, of drawing us together uh, as one. Another point, the new covenant was cut between the Father and the Son. This is really important as we talk about some of the other things in a minute. This is really important that we understand this. The new covenant was not cut between God and us. It was cut between the Father and the Son. And the Son. Uh, now, this is important because it'll, there's a lot of implications of this. But let me just explain how it worked. When, when in ancient days, when two parties, two let's say two tribes or whatever, were going to enter into a covenant, what they would do, they would select a representative from each party, and those two parties would enter into the covenant, and the, re, the those two individuals would enter into the covenant, and then. The, each of the parties that they represented would enter into the covenant through those two people that had entered the agreement. So they would stand between uh, around the flesh. They would make the pronouncements of blessings and promises and curses for disobedience. They would do all that, and everybody else would enter into those 
that agreement in their, in their decision. Well, in the new covenant, Jesus was the representative of the Father. He came to earth as a covenant representative to cut the covenant which took place at the cross. Jesus was also the covenant representative of man. Uh, he was the one that represented us, but he was fully God and he was fully man. And so he was the, he was the representative uh, of man. And so that's how we get the idea, Hebrews 8, 6, that he is a mediator of a new covenant. He's the mediator. He is the, the representative of the Father and of mankind. Now, when we start talking a little bit about the steps, you'll get, uh, th this will be a very important thing to understand. But understand this, that Jesus is the mediator uh, of the new covenant. It was between the Father uh, and the Son. I want to say this too. The Lord, I wasn't really planning on saying this, but the Lord put this in my heart. I don't, it probably doesn't pertain to anybody here, but maybe some that are watching on YouTube or whatever. The only covenants that the scriptures talk about are our covenant with God and our covenant with our spouse. Um, you know, there's some churches around that say that when you join our church, you're making a covenant to be a part of our church. Uh, and even some go so far as that, you know, if you make this kind of covenant, it's irrevocable and you really can't leave or otherwise you go into it. You're cursed if you do, if you leave it. Um, now, you think, oh, no, I don't believe that. Uh, but I'm telling you, we've ministered to people who have, been, who have come out of churches who the church that they were part of said you're entering into a covenant with this with us and so you can't leave this because if you do you'll be cursed i want to say that get out of there right now if that's a church if you're involved in a church like that that is not of god we're in covenant with we're in covenant with christ and we're in covenant with our mate if we're married those are the two covenants that are biblical covenants. Uh, so anyway, enough about that. The, the new covenant, here's another important point about covenant. The new covenant is internal. You know, back to Hebrews chapter 8, uh, you know, you could read really all of chapter 8, but if you go down to verse 10, for in this covenant, of this covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them upon their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And so the point here is that the new covenant is internal. It's in our heart. It's an internal covenant. The old covenants, now the Abrahamic covenant, the, old, the Mosaic covenant, the old covenant, those were external. And it's a big, there's a big difference there, but God is in, has put the new covenant inside our spirit, inside our heart, uh, which makes a big difference. You know, one of the big differences, you know, if you, if you think about the Old Testament covenants, uh, they were requiring people to be obedient, but it was an external obedience. You, do, you know, you don't do this, you don't do this. It was based on, mainly on actions. But the internal covenant, Jesus, you know, you see it in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, Jesus took the external law and he says, look, I'm not throwing this away. I'm, in fact, I'm putting it in your heart. You know, where don't speak in anger. And the Lord says, well, you know, that's what they've said. Now, if you just, you don't have any anger even in your heart. He talks about that with sexual sin. He talks about it with other things. All the Beatitudes are there. So the new covenant is an internal covenant. And when we talk about the steps, I want, you to talk, I want you to think about this. I want you to think that all that takes place in, in entering into a covenant is taking place inside your heart, inside your spirit. It's not an external thing. It's an internal thing. Uh, very important distinction uh, that we understand this because it, it, it brings a lot of freedom, but it brings a lot of expectation uh, as well. Uh, so... It's an internal 
covenant. Uh, next point, I'm just kind of sharing some general things and I want to go through some of these steps, not all of them. But the next point is that God is loyal and faithful to his covenant. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. Let me just read that verse. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God. He is a faithful God uh, who keeps covenant. I'm having trouble reading my scriptures. Well. He leads covenant and his loving kindness. Wait a minute. His, let me get it up here. Okay, here we go. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Now, I want to talk about that word loving kindness. Uh, you know, I always thought that loving kindness meant that God loves us and that he is kind. It's kind of, did anybody else ever think that? He loves us and he is, he is kind. Uh, but as I began to study this, uh, and actually I went to, in my seminary training, uh, we had to go down to the New Orleans for, the, for the, some classes. And one, we had a, a class on theology of the Old Testament. It's one of the best classes I ever had at, the, at seminary. And, the, and he made this one point. He said the meaning of that word loving kindness means loyalty to God's covenant. He is faithful he is loyal to his covenant. And so when we're in covenant relationship, God is faithful to it. He is faithful to his covenant promises. He is faithful to all that he says in his scriptures. He is faithful. And that word, uh, kesed is the, the Hebrew word. It has so many uh, applications. There's a legal aspect to it. It's a legal commitment God is making to those in covenant. It's a word that's focused on those who are in covenant relationship with him more so uh, than just to a word to the general population of the earth. It's a specific word of God's attitude toward those who are in covenant relationship with him. He is, it's a legal thing. It expresses his strength, and his character, his love, and, and his everlasting devotion. So you could just maybe generalize it to say that because God is, has a, is a loving kindness that is expressed forever, he is devoted to his covenant relationship with those who he's entered into. Now, to me, that is a huge blessing that God is devoted in covenant, loving kindness with his people. You look, we can face a lot of things, but we can know that God has legally bound himself to us in love and devotion, and he is strong enough. He is able. There is not a single issue. There's not a single person. There's nothing that comes close to having the power and the authority of our God. We can, do, we can trust him just, and just take the, just the idea of salvation. We've been born again. We've, we've accepted him. We can trust that he is devoted to take us successfully to heaven when we die, when it's our time. We don't have to worry. Can the de can, is it real? Can the devil steal it? God is able and, he's, and he loves us and he will carry us through. But the same is true for other issues that we face, whether it's sickness or lack or whatever the problem, God is a lo God of loving kindness who is here to help us and to carry us safely through. He is loyal to his covenant. Um, now, let's talk. I want to shift gears a little bit. I want to talk now about helping us understand covenant. Uh, when I wrote the book that I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, I did a lot of research on different steps of covenant making that would took place in ancient culture. Uh, and um, it's interesting, I, as I began to look at this, I, I said, in my studies, I would say, okay, is this true in the scriptures? So do we see this in the scriptures, in the Old Testament and the New? Uh, and it's interesting that you do. You, know, you see these steps uh, in the scriptures as the way Christ 
uh, uh, enter, entered into the new covenant relationship that we're part of, as well as you see it with Abraham and, and the Mosaic covenant uh, as well. Uh, and so it seems like this, this is what it seems to me, is that God took what was happening in ancient culture because it was going on during the days of Abraham, going back way back to ancient days, that people were making covenants with each other. Um, they were making those covenants, and it's, not, it's as though God took what was going on in culture so that they could under, people could understand it, and he said, okay, this is what I, the way I'm going to demonstrate it as I enter into covenant with my people. And so these steps of covenant making uh, become a pretty become an important aspect, not only because they took place in, in ancient history, but because they are steps that God goes through, and they have meaning to us in terms of our walk uh, with uh, the, the Lord. And there, there are about eight of them that were common. Now, not every ancient covenant had all these eight, but there were about eight of them, that, and I'm just going to list them here, then I'm going to talk about two or three of them. Uh, there was a pre-ceremony activity or action. There was the selection of the covenant representative and the cutting of the covenant sacrifice. The third step was the exchange of robes and belts and weapons. Uh, the fourth step is the walk unto death. The fifth step is the pronouncement of blessings and curses. The sixth one is the seal of the covenant mark. The seventh one is the exchange of names. And the eighth one is the covenant meal. Now, I'm not going to try to go through all these, uh, but if you have an interest in it, the book that I recommended goes through each step, and it talks about how you see it in the old covenant and how you see it in the new covenant uh, as well. If you're interested in it, to dig into it, you can get that. Um, but let's talk about the pre-ceremony actions because this is, defines how God wants to act with us. Listen, we'll just look, you can see it in the Old Testament too, but I was going to just focus on the New Testament on Christ. When Jesus came to earth, we, we to, he was headed toward the cross. He knew he was going to the cross. And the, and the, the cross was the actual cutting of the new covenant. When he went to the cross, you know, with the tearing of his flesh and with the shedding of his blood, that was the actual cutting of the new covenant. But before he did that, he came to earth and for three and a half years he ministered. And what he was doing, he, he was laying out the terms of the covenant. He said, this is the new covenant that I'm cutting with you. I'm, and I'm laying it out for you. I'm going to cut this covenant uh, at the cross. Uh, and it had been prophesied that this was all going to happen, you know, back in Jeremiah and other Old Testament prophets. But he said, this is the way you're going to live. This is the, this is the expectation. Do you want to enter into this covenant? This is the way it's going to be. And, you know, you see passages, uh, you know, in terms of the expectation side of it, you see passages like Luke chapter 14, uh, you know, starting with like 21. If you want to be my disciple, you've got to hate your father and mother. And he doesn't really want you to hate him, but, you know, to love him so much more that it's almost like hate. You've got to take up your cross daily and you've got to follow me. And so he was saying, this is not just some optional thing. This is the terms and conditions that I'm laying out uh, as it relates to entering into a covenant with me. But he also has talked about the blessings, okay? The blessing will be eternal life. I'll give you eternal life. The blessings were uh, also things like Luke chapter 4. I'm coming to preach the gospel to the poor, to, to give sight to the blind, to, you know, to heal the sick. He demonstrated a lot of the promises. And he says, so basically what he was saying for three and a half years, he went through his earthly ministry and he said, uh, he said, this is what it's like to enter into a covenant. There are expectations for that, but yet there are blessings that go along with it. Do you want to enter into it? You know? And he cut the covenant with that understanding. So the point for us is if we want to enter into the covenant, we've got to enter the new covenant. If we want to be born again, we've got to enter into this expectation and promise of blessing. It's not just confessing Jesus uh, in, a, in a service and living any, any way we want to live. 
is surrendering our life to live for him. That's what the new covenant is about. Now, obviously, you know, those of us that have been walking with the Lord for a while, you realize that we're not going to get there overnight. It's a lifetime journey, but it's a decision that this is the way I want, I want to live. It's an understanding that leads to that decision that this is what is expected of me. And so, I mean, it scares me sometimes that many, many people in the American church have never made that connection between living for God and, and making some sort of decision for him. And only God knows who's saved. But if, you wanna, if we want to enter into the new covenant, uh, we've got to share, we've got to expect and respond to those terms and the conditions uh, of that. Amen. Uh, now let's look at the, I want to look at uh, I want to look at the selection of covenant representatives and cutting of the covenant sacrifice. Um, yeah, we talked about that where you know it, two parties are going to two parties are going to uh, enter into a covenant. They sele each select a representative. Well, Jesus was that. We talked about this already. Jesus was the mediator. On behalf of mankind, he was a mediator on behalf of the Father. He was a mediator uh, of the new covenant. Uh, so he, he cut the covenant. He was the covenant sacrifice. He was all those things. So the, the new covenant was secured in Christ, in Christ. Um, now, I want to connect that with an internal, the covenant being internal. And this may get a little complicated, but I want to make I want you to grasp this. It's important. He was our, our covenant sacrifice. It's an internal covenant, okay? So we talked about that. It's not some just an external. It's taking place in our heart. Jesus is our covenant representative. Now, when we are born again, Jesus comes to live within our heart. And we know we know this. And so, because the covenant was cut between the Father and the Son, it's dependent upon Christ and His work in what He did. And so, what happens is this. He comes to live within us, and in our spirit, He comes in and uh, we are one in spirit with him. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says this really clearly. When we are one with Christ in our spirit, at the moment we are born again. So what is true of Christ as our covenant representative is true of us in our spirit, which means we're righteous, We've been given a gift of righteousness. Romans five seventeen says that very clearly. Uh, we are loved, even in our failures and our weaknesses and our uh, defilement from our past. We're still loved. We're accepted in the beloved. That we can even with that with sin in our lives, we can we can go boldly before the throne of grace. And so because he, the covenant was cut between the Father and the Son, that is, is dependent upon the work of Christ. And so so many people live in condemnation, in guilt, in unworthiness, and with a works mentality that if I want to be accepted by God, I've got to work, 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 and I've got to do this to please Him. Now, I'm not saying we don't do any of those things. Obviously, we do. But in our spirit, that's how we go to heaven. I mean, we could never get good enough to go to heaven if it weren't for the perfection of Christ living within us. Uh, you know, let me just, let me read Colossians chapter 3. Find Colossians here. This important verse. 
set your mind on things above. But verse 3, Colossians 3, verse 3, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So our life is hidden with Christ internally in our spirit. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have to be sanctified and be transformed because, you know, you know, Paul also wrote a couple of verses later, therefore, because of that, you've got to still pursue sanctification. And he goes through the putting off the old man and putting on the new. But in our spirit, because the covenant was cut between the Father and the Son, because it's internal, uh, and because Christ is our covenant representative, our spirit is made perfect at the, at the point of salvation. Now that is a liberating truth to so many people. But he also comes, and this is where, so we can't just, you know, a lot of churches stop right there. A lot of movement, I'd say movements, a lot of movements stop right there that we're righteous and there's no other point to it. But I, I like this idea. Matthew 21, Jesus is in his triumphant infant entrance uh, into Jerusalem before he goes to the cross a week later. Uh, and his first act uh, after he enters is he goes to the temple to cleanse it. So this same Jesus who has said, uh, you're righteous in your spirit, when you enter into covenant, he's going to make a triumphant entry into your heart. And he wants to cleanse it. He wants to cleanse it. Look what he did. Jesus entered the temple. This is uh, Matthew 21, verse 12. He entered the temple, and Jesus entered the temple and cast out all those who were buying, all those who were buying and selling in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. And so we see that we see that he does he did that. Then he also, while he was in the temple, and the blind and the lame, he came to them in the temple and he healed them. And so we see this two, these two things taking place. And picture them as a part of the covenant. He's, he's entered into you and he's got the same views, the same actions. He's coming and he's trying to overthrow. Now, hopefully, if we're not rebellious and hard is more gentle than this picture seems to be. Uh, but his goal is the same. He wants to overthrow all the self-seeking. He wants to overthrow all the flesh. He wants to overthrow all the various uh, uh, issues of sin and self. That's what he wants to do is he wants to overthrow all those things. And there's a lifelong process of that, of him overthrowing all of that uh, so that his temple can be a, a temple of purity, cleansed, uh, uh, focused on his goals and his purposes. But he also comes uh, where he comes and those who are humble, he heals, uh, the, he heals the blind and the lame. The blind can't see who he is. The lame can't walk effectively. He wants to bring healing there. Now look at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, starting with verse 18. Jesus just started his ministry. He comes into Nazareth, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, Recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. So this just picture that he's not for this for uh, for us. He's not just coming to Nazareth. He's coming into our heart. Now I know he means that for the the world as well. But let's just say he's coming into our heart. He's coming into our heart to preach the gospel to us. He's coming into our to our heart to. Uh, proclaim release where we're in bondage to captivity. He wants to release us from all that. He wants to give us sight where we're, where we're blind. He wants to set free when we're downtrodden. He wants to bring healing and encouragement 
to us uh, in these things and to proclaim to us the favorable year of the Lord. So in this, in this new covenant that we've entered into, Jesus comes into our heart. He makes our spirit righteous, loved, accepted in his beloved. But then he begins to work on our soul, cleansing it and, and transforming it into his image. But at the same time, while he's doing that, he wants to touch those broken places in our hearts. And this is, what, this is kind of the point where I'm heading here, where we gotta, where we got to depend on our covenant relationship. we got to call on him where we're, when we're in need, where we're broken, where we're hurting, uh, where we're sick, where the doctors can't say there's nothing else they can do, whatever it may be, we've got to call upon our covenant partner. And the American church has drifted, as a whole, has drifted from that, that approach. Now, that doesn't mean we can't go to a doctor and we can't use doctors and we can't, medicine can be good. I'm not, God, it's, a lot of that is a gift from God. But we've got to, what if that's taken away from us? Or what if you've got to confess your allegiance to the Antichrist system in order to get into the healthcare system or order to, in order to function in the economy or in order to do whatever? We, more and more and more, we're going to have to learn to depend upon our covenant relationship with Christ. Because those, those issues are going are to come. So he's going to cleanse us. He's going to use a lot of what's happening in the world and going to continue to happen in the world to bring his church into maturity, to bring that cleansing. And so we say, as much as hard as that's going to be, we say amen to that because we want him to have that bride prepared. But at the same time, we've got to learn to hang on and, and, and to believe uh, him for these promises. Let me go through these others. I've kind of talked about them, but I want to make sure we, we hit these other two promises, the, our, our steps of covenant making. The walk, one of the steps is the walk unto death. Because this is the pen, our, our, if we want to walk in the promises of God, we've got to also take the walk unto death. The walk unto death, what, hap, what that was in a covenant, you've got the animal sacrifice uh, laid out, the blood on the ground and both parties would walk through the pieces of the flesh and they would say, they would get there and they would say, if I don't fulfill my part of the covenant, let this be done unto me that was done to this covenant, uh, to, these, to this animal. In other words, let me die if I don't, do, if I don't live to what, what I promised based on the terms and the conditions. Um, now, we see that Jesus took that walk into death going up to the cross. We see it also in Genesis 15 with Abraham where God walked between the flesh. But we have to do it. We have to take our walk unto death also. Now we've talked about that of living uh, and the, the promises of Luke 14 or the expectations of Luke 14 uh, of where Christ takes priority. Luke 9, 23, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. And all that's in there, uh, in the scriptures, that's our walk unto death. If, and if we want to live, if we want to live in the promises of God, that's part of it. We can't expect him. Now, he, sometimes he does do miraculous things even if we're not walking with him. I'm not saying that he can't do it. Obviously, God can do what he wants. But if we want to live by covenant and we, if we want to call on him to be our covenant blesser, our provider of our needs, we've got to learn to, to, walk, to take that walk unto death on a daily basis. I die to myself. I die to not uh, whatever it is. And as he highlights things, we repent of those things and we ask him to transform us and all of those things. That walk unto death is a, is a lifestyle that is required if we want to walk in the promises and the blessings of the Lord, of his covenant promises to us. Um, now, the next, I'll go through one more step. Uh, the pronouncing of blessings and curses. In a covenant, they would stand on the, next to the pieces and, and they would pronounce blessings for obedience and curses if they disobeyed. Now, we see that actually 
uh, and I think it's in the book of Deuteronomy. It's in, uh, right as they were entering into the land, they would, uh, what I was saying, I didn't go back and look at this, at Mount Gerizim, or one of the two mountains, one tribe, one half of the, them would pronounce blessings for obedience, and the other would uh, pronounce curses for disobedience. So we're going to look at that next uh, <coughs> Sunday, the blessing, heirs to the blessings of Abraham. Uh, we'll look at that in, in detail next week. But there's blessing and there's curses. Now, the good news for us is that Jesus redeemed us from the curse of sin and death and the law. Now, uh, we'll, we'll deal with Galatians chapter 3 a lot next week, so I'm not going to go there, but it's clearly in there in Galatians chapter 3. He, Paul makes it very clear that, that the covenant promises that were the new covenant and all, and all the covenant, well, the new covenant, was that Gentiles are part of that. He makes that point in, in Galatians chapter 3. And then he also says that we're heirs to the blessings of Abraham. Now, we'll talk about some of that next week because that's really important in terms of appropriating uh, and walking in the promises and the blessings uh, of God. But for now, say, let's say this. We take the walk and the death when we surrender to Christ. And, we do, and that's a daily thing for the rest of our lives. But at the same time, we have access to the promises of God. We have access to believe the promises of God. Now, we can, in our head, we can believe every one of them. Oh, I believe God is my healer. But do we really cry out to him for our healing? We can believe he's our provider, but what, what do we really live on the provision of our job and our economy? So what God wants us to do is learn to live by his promises, not just mental assent to those things, but to live by them. Because they are an anchor to our soul. Now, one more passage of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Really, you could read all the, the whole chapter. It talks about in verse 12... place. Verse 12, that the, the, the promises of God are uh, fulfilled through faith and patience. Those are how that we inherit the promises. But if you go on, you get up to, let's start with verse 17. In the same way, God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose uh, interposed with an oath. Remember that, interposed with an oath, in order that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, that we may have strong encouragement, we who have fled for refuge in laying hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil which Christ has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, here, here's what I, the points I want to make. When you go back to 17, talked about inter, inter, um, interposed with an oath. That's a term for covenant. That's a covenant term. And if you look up the Greek, the meaning of that word in the Greek, you'll find that part of the meaning of that is that that's a mediator of a covenant. Uh, in other words, Christ has mediated the new covenant. And so, with an oath, but then the point I want you, the second point, first is to make the point that this is talking about our covenant relationship with Christ based on that meaning of that word, interposed with an oath. But then the, the end of it is this becomes an anchor of the soul. And this is, where, this is where covenant walking and covenant needs to come for us. All these things we've talked about are, are true and part of a covenant walk, but this overall relationship 
And especially as we're, what we're talking about is beginning to live by the promises of, of covenant. These, the covenant becomes an anchor for the soul to keep us drifting. So, okay, I've got a need. I've got an anchor, Christ and his covenant that I can hang to, hang on to, I can hold fast to. Now, it doesn't mean that every time I'm sick and I pray, I'm going to get healed. Uh, God may or may not do that. But it's still an anchor. Uh, it's a foundation. It's a paradigm. It's a, it's a structure that we can hang on to where we have a need. And we're going to need to, we're going to have to learn to live this way. This is what the Lord's put in my heart. We're going to have to, church is going to, an American church is going to have to learn to live this way. You know, we do a lot of work in Africa, as you know, and, you know, a lot, I've got a lot of really good friends who, uh, who are in Africa, and they, they have to live this way every day. They have to live this way, and they've had to live this way all their life. Uh, and when I have a need, I love to ask my African buddies to, uh, to pray for me because, I mean, they, they pray. I mean, they, they really pray. You know, like, you know, some, sometimes like there's one, the, one of them's wife was sick not too long ago and the doctor prescribed medicine, but he couldn't afford it. So he couldn't, he couldn't depend on the health care system. And so he had to pray and God provided the healing. The American church, I believe, in the days ahead is going to have to learn more and more to live that way. We need an anchor. We need an anchor to hang on to. So that if our health care system is taken away or if we have to do something, so make some sort of allegiance to an antichrist system in order to, uh, to be allowed into the health care system or to be able to get a job, you know, so that we can depend on the economy, or who knows wherever it is, whatever the issues are. We need a covenant, we need an anchor that we can hang on to that's outside this whole system, that doesn't depend upon this system. And that anchor, obviously, is Christ and the whole relationship of covenant that he has given to us as his believers. And so that's my challenge for myself and for all of us is that we learn more and more what it means to live by covenant first and then to be able to live this way. Christ is the anchor, obviously, but he's made this promise of a covenant relationship as the way because it talks about it right here in Hebrews 6. He's the mediator of a covenant. And chapter 8 talks about all, the whole, it's part of the book, talks about that. God wants us to live by covenant. And so I pray that we all do that. Amen. Amen. I'm going to get...